Man, let's get another round of applause for those kids. That was awesome, guys. I don't even know why I need to be up here. I mean, that should be enough for you, right? Man, great job, guys. So, so good. I am so excited uh, to be up here today, and I am so excited that those kids got to come up here and soften you up before I got up here. Uh, but man, again, awesome job. Um, let's pray. Let's pray before we get started. Father God, I thank you so much for this day, and God, I, man, God, I just thank you so much for all that you're already doing this Christmas season, God, for all that you've already shown us, for all that you've, you've done for us, Lord. God, I just pray right now that as we dive into your word, Lord, and we learn more about you, I pray that we would fall more in love with you. God, that we would see your glory and understand you better. Um, Father, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, get me out of the way, bring your word. God, I love you, and I just pray that you would use me in this time. You name we pray. Amen. So we're, if you haven't noticed by our decorations or maybe going outside or turning on the television or checking Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever you use, you might notice we're, we're fairly deep into this holiday and Christmas season, and I'm thankful that we get opportunities like this to, to come together and slow down a little bit and just get to worship and praise our Savior, whether that's through corporate worship with our amazing band and Timothy or through the, these kids coming up and leading, leading us through Christmas carols or you having to sit there while the youth pastor talks at you. Like whatever, it, whatever it is, I'm so glad that we get these moments to slow down and remember why we do all of this, why we choose to celebrate this holiday. This reason being the gift of Christ to a broken and undeserving world from a holy, perfect, glorious God. And the beauty of that fact is that the gift of Christ truly is a gift. It's a free gift, and with it came an abundance of hope and peace and joy, in which during this month of December, as we grow together during this time and this Christmas holiday, we as a church have been kind of going through a series over gifts. Uh, last week, Clay talked about the gift of a son, a gift that we were given from God. Not, not a gift of S-U-N the son, S-O-N the son. I had to explain that to somebody the other day. They said, like, gift of the son? I said, no, gift of the son, you know, baby Jesus. And we talked about what it means not to let this gift lose its meaning, uh, this message, the story of Christ being born in this world, how we shouldn't let its power be lost on us as it often does when things get busy. Um, and as we read about this angel, Gabriel, coming to Mary and explaining to her that she was chosen to be the mother of the Messiah, that even though she was a virgin, even though she was a young woman, even though she was a broken human, God was choosing her for this amazing thing. And through her, we receive this gift of a son. And Gabriel explained this to her, which is, I have to be honest, why I feel very confident today to stand before you and finally put to rest a question that we hear every holiday season, Mary, did you know? Yes. <laughs> yes, she did. Mary knew. Did Mary know? Yes. I can tell you confidently, Mary knew. And yes, I'm fully aware, and you might notice this row of students right here shaking their heads and giving me the, the stink eye, because we've argued about this before, and I'm sure every mother in the room has little bells going off, because moms, I know you love that song. I know you love Mary, Did You Know, but I can't stand it. <laughs> I can't stand that. So every time it comes on the radio, Mary, did you know? Yep, whoop, turn it off. I, I'm just, I'm not a fan. And as a, ever since I was a young kid, I couldn't understand why that song was so popular because it, it says very clearly in scripture that when Gabriel came and talked to her, he gave a very vivid and substantial rundown of who this child was going to be and what he was going to do. But before I dig myself into a deeper hole and upset anybody else, I, I want to say this. Today, we get to look at Mary's response to that message. Her response to this life-changing news when Gabriel said, you are going to be the mother of Christ. And even though I think the song, Mary, Did You Know, can be a, a little bit trivial, we actually see Mary sing her own song in response to this calling placed on her life. A song of praise that we call the Magnificat. And this is a song, I believe, that shows us what this next gift we're going to talk about today is, and that is the gift of joy. 
So if you'll join me in the scriptures, we're going to be uh, in Luke chapter 1 today. We haven't moved on to chapter 2, but we'll be in Luke chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 38. We're, we're going to read all the way down to 56 as we go. Um, but Gabriel delivers this news to Mary. And we see three responses in what we're about to read. And the first, in the first one in verse 38, which is where Pastor Clay left off last week, Mary responds in this way. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So immediately out of the gate, the first response we see is obedience. And so we know something here. We know something that even though Mary has been given this crazy life-altering calling, Mary trusts and loves the Lord to the point that the only question she has for him is, how can this be? How can I have a child if I'm still a virgin? And that's obedience, church. To say, well, how can this be even though I'm still a virgin? And angel says, God's going to handle it. And she says, all right, let your will be done. That's how much she trusted and loved the Lord. Second response we see is this. She packs up. Uh, she heads to Judah to see her relative Elizabeth, who Gabriel just told Mary that despite Elizabeth's age, despite the fact that she was barren, Elizabeth is pregnant with child. And so we're going to be in verse 39, and we'll read through 45 together in Luke chapter 1, and it says this. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, greeted, and when she entered the house of Zechariah, and she greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the, tr is the fruit in your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So Mary gets up, and with haste, it says, haste meaning she was booking it, she was moving, she wasn't wasting any time. She gets up, and she goes to see Elizabeth, and as soon as she greets Elizabeth, and as we know pre from previous parts of Scripture, a mute Zechariah, because he doubted the Lord, uh, as soon as she greets Elizabeth, little baby John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. Just look at what Elizabeth says uh, when she's filled with the Holy Spirit, back in verse 44, she says, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Church, immediately, immediately the presence of the Savior within Mary began to bring joy into this world. Even before his birth, the gift of Christ was a gift of joy. Isaiah 12, 6 says it beautifully. It says, Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Church, the Holy One is great, and he brings great joy. Even when he was just within his mother's womb, he was already bringing great joy. And that is the gift that Christ came to bring into this world. That is what he brings us. He brings joy. The gift of the Son as we talked about last week, is also the gift of newfound joy. And then we see a third response that Mary gives after she hears what Elizabeth has to say. And it's in the form of this song we call the Magnificat. Um, so we're going to start back in verse 46, and we're going to read all the way through to verse 56, and it says this. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their, their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months, and then returned to her home. 
Church, this song that Mary sings, and I, I know I didn't sing it, but that's for your benefit, but this is a song. This Magnificat, as it is called, is a song of praise. This is a song of joy. And church, my main point today, and what I believe we must glean from this song of praise given to us by Mary is this. Our God is a giver of joy. He gives joy as a gift, and he takes great joy in giving it. God takes great joy in giving joy to others. I'm going to say joy a lot today. Just bear with me. And I think so often that sometimes we tend to think of God up in heaven, knowing all of our sins, knowing everything we've done wrong, knowing all of our brokenness, knowing the worst thoughts we have, the worst actions we've committed, and that he's just looking down at us like a disappointing fa- disappointed father whose child has no hope. But church, he's not, because we aren't. He isn't looking down at us like hopeless children because we are not without hope. Church, the gift, the gift of the Son and the joy that comes with him, that is our hope. God sent Jesus to complete us in our broken state and in our sin and to make us complete in his joy and in our joy that comes with it. So no, take away this vision of this unforgiving, unloving God detached and uncaring coming from his throne in the sky because that isn't who he is. He is a good father. And as a good father, he gives joy. Matthew 7, 8 through 11 says this. It says, for everyone who asks receives. This is Jesus talking, by the way. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask of him? Church, your God is a joy giver. Your God gives joy. And there is no better picture of that gift of joy than what we have in Jesus. And the fact that God sent his son into the world as we celebrate this year around Christmas to be born among us and to save us. The celebration of Christmas church is a celebration of joy. And I could end it right there. I could wrap it up and say nothing else and we could all go to lunch and beat the rush. As my old pastor would say, we could beat the Methodists to lunch. We could wrap it up right there. But I think we need to know why. I think we need to know what it means that our God is a joy giver and why that is important. And number one, I, I believe it's, it helps us understand God's character. And understanding who God is is so necessary, church, for, for loving him. Because when we don't understand his character, we miss out on a love that is better than anything you could hope for. You, when you don't understand his character, you're missing out on a joy that is better than anything you could hope for. And church, as I said a moment ago, to look at God as this angry, unforgiving tyrant is to miss the mark of who he is. Yes, he's a God of justice. Yes, he is a God that demands that sin and the breaking of his law be dealt with. But in the midst of that judgment, in the midst of that justice, is the heart of one who demands holiness, but is also a father who loves and a father who forgives, and a father who gives us hope and joy. Psalm 30, verses four through five say, sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Church, his joy will always be found at the end of all things. This world was weeping and it was struggling and it was in a state of pain in in the night, in the darkness, just as we are now. And the birth of Jesus Christ on this earth was the, the gift of joy that we found. The birth of Jesus was the morning that broke through the night, was the joy that came with the morning. That's what God did when he sent his son here on earth. He brought joy in the morning to us. That is the character of our God. That is why we must understand this, that God is a giver of joy. Which leads me to my second reason that we need to understand this. We need it. I don't think a single person in this room would disagree with me that 
we're all in great need of joy these days. You know, I look around the room and I know a lot of you and I know your hurts. I know your struggles. I know where the church has failed you. I know where people have failed you. I know where your family and your friends and your children have failed you. I know where you struggle and I know the, the parts in your life where you don't have a whole lot of joy. I know the weight you bear at your jobs, the weight you guys bear at school, as parents, as children, as teachers, as workers. I know that you need joy. And then there are those of you who have things going on that I don't know about, that maybe nobody knows about. Addiction, the loss of loved ones, anger, financial struggles, your struggles as a spouse, your struggles as a parent, that you keep hidden, that you pray that nobody knows. You can't turn on the television or, or open up your phone these days and not see something that takes your hope away, I bet. Church, our world is in great need of joy. We're all in great need of joy, and I know that you are in great need of joy. And praise God because he gives it. Praise God because he gives us rest. He gives us peace when there's none to be found. And when the world around us is on fire and it's falling apart, he is the one that because of him, we get to have peace in our soul. We get to have peace with him. And in that peace, there is joy to be found. So what do we do now? We know that God's a giver of joy. We know that it reveals his character and we know that we need it. We need joy. So what do we do? What do we do with it now that we know that he gives us that joy? And the answer is really simple, church. We do what Mary did. Mary's response to the joy that she had at this calling on her life, her response to God telling her that she was going to give birth to his son, her response to that joy was immediately to turn around and magnify the Lord. That's where we get the word magnificat. I've, I've always looked at that and I always thought that was a weird word, but that's where it comes from. It comes from the word to magnify. The first word she sings is, my soul magnifies the Lord. And church, when you magnify something, you look closely at it. It helps others see it better. You bring glory to it and you bring more attention to it. And so to say that my soul magnifies the Lord is to say my innermost being glorifies and gives recognition to this amazing thing that the Lord has done. And so Mary is saying, look at my God. Look how amazing he is. Look how strong he is. Look at how good my God is. And that's her song, church. That's what it does. It magnifies the Lord. It glorifies him and it highlights his goodness. Look at, look at what she sings. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call him or call me blessed. She says, look how merciful he was to me. Look how good he is. Look, look at me, a broken human, how great he is and the things he has done for me. She says, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Look how holy my God is. Look how just and righteous and perfect my God is. And she moves on, she says, and his mercy for me, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. She says, if you fear him, his mercy is there. If you love him, there is mercy for you. He is merciful. And he has been that way since the beginning of time. And he will be that way for the rest of eternity. He is merciful and loving from generation to generation. He is not gonna change. That is who my God is. She goes on and she says, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. She says, look how strong my God is. Look at how mighty he is, how he brings down the proud and the mighty humans to humbleness. And he brings those who are humble and he exalts them. That's what my God does. He says, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He takes care of me. He takes care of me. Look how caring my God is, how he takes care of the hungry and the thirsty and the poor. That is who my God looks out for. And if you're rich, he's going to put you in, his pl in your place. That is who my God is. He brings people to righteousness. He brings them joy. And she ends it by saying, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. 
Look how merciful he is, how he has kept his promise to his people, his promise to love them, his promise to protect them, his promise to give them new life. He has kept that promise because that is who my God is. When I magnify him, I am magnifying. I am showing his love to everyone. I am telling people that this is who my God is. You need to know this. I will magnify him within my soul if that's what I have to do. If my legs don't work, that's fine. If my voice doesn't work, whatever. If I can't walk, sing, dance, or do anything, my soul will still magnify how awesome and great my God is because that is who he is. And as Clay said last week, we cannot let that power and and knowing that escape us this Christmas season. We cannot be distracted from that because our God is big and mighty and good and loving, and we cannot forget that. Church, Mary's response to joy was to turn right back around to the one who gives it, and she praised him. And church, that's what our response to joy should be as well. We should be turning right back around to the one who gives it to us and praising him. As I begin to wrap up, uh, the band can join me back on stage if they want. I'm almost done. Um, Church, I know that every day there are reasons to not be joyful. That when we look at our circumstances and, and sometimes even at the places where God has placed us in life, that that joy might be the last thing on your mind, that when you look around, joy might be the last thing you're thinking about. But I will say this, Mary had countless reasons to be unhappy about this calling God gave her. Her song could have very easily started out by saying, my soul is kind of upset at the Lord. But that's not what happened. But church, Mary was about to become a social pariah. She was a young, unwed engaged to be married girl who wound up pregnant and now she's claiming, well, God did it. It, it, It's immaculate conception. What? She was about to be the talk of the town. No one in Nazareth was going to not know this news. She had a fiance. She had a young man that she was betrothed to who technically, legally, could have had her stoned for infidelity. He had every legal right to look at her and say, why would you do this? You have to pay for this crime, but praise God that Joseph was a good man. Praise God that Joseph listened to the angel just as Mary did. She had her whole life ahead of her and this huge life-changing thing that God put in her life, man, I wouldn't have blamed her for not having joy. But in the midst of all those circumstances, because Mary understood that her God was a good father who gives joy and loves her, her response was to turn and in great joy magnify the Lord. So church, I urge you, see past your circumstances this holiday season. And in great joy with this gift that is Christ Jesus, accept it, accept that gift and turn and magnify him. So this Christmas, before you obsess over gifts or the Christmas music, whether the song is great or terrible, or movies, or before you focus on all your struggles, I pray that you turn in your joy and you look to others and you say, look how good my God is. Look how awesome and mighty he is. Look how much he loves me. Look how much he loves you that he would send his son to this earth to live the life that I should be living and to die on the cross and to pay the price that I should have paid, magnify the Lord this Christmas season, church. Magnify him within your soul and to everyone else around you. And church, if you don't know him, if you don't know the Lord, and you don't know this gift of joy, I urge you, do not hesitate. Don't wait another second. Don't waste another moment of your life not knowing that gift, not knowing that joy, not knowing that forgiveness and grace that he gives. I'm going to end with Romans chapter 15, verses 12 through 13. And it says this. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We pray with me.